I directly felt like AI was the, the perfect field just because I, I liked to explain it. I liked mm -hmm. to, to work on it. And it was also a way to use math and, and, and research and apply it. It's, it's, it's just like the perfect combination for me on everything. All right. So hello everyone and welcome to the AI Stories podcast. I'm Neil Lizer. I'm a data scientist at Iwaka and I will be your host. So today our guest is Louis Bouchard. Louis first studied engineering and then did a master in AI at ETS in Montreal. And after that, he actually did a PhD at Mila, which is the Montreal Institute of Learning Algorithms, which was founded by Joshua Benjo. He's still currently doing his PhD there, actually. On top of this, he also founded his YouTube channel, What's AI, which has over 40K subscribers and where he actually explains research algorithms in simple terms. On top of everything, he is also the co-founder and community lead at what towards AI. And we're going to talk about all of this in this episode. So AI Stories brings together some of the best data scientists, ML engineers, and tech leaders to talk about AI and their career. If you enjoy the episode, subscribe to my YouTube channel and leave a five-star review. All right, let's start now. Hi, Louis. How is it going? How are you today? Hi, great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And you? Yeah, all good. It's great to have you all the way from Canada. I don't think I've ever had a guest in Canada, so you're the first one. Yeah, it's crazy that we can do a podcast across the, the world. <laughs> yeah, everything is possible in 2023. But yeah, great to get to know you. Let's start with your YouTube channel. I mentioned that you've got over like 40k subscribers, which is pretty impressive. Um, can you talk a bit about what's AI, like what is your YouTube channel doing and how did you start? Yes, of course. Actually, you you described it very well and I might steal your explanation <laughs> in the future. But yeah, that's pretty much what I want to do with the channel is to explain any AI related either research or application as simply as possible. So basically I say like demystify artificial intelligence, because I think it's important to understand how these algorithms that basically controls our life, it, it's, it's interesting to understand them and just to being able to first leverage them like as op optimally as possible, but also either not fear them or fear them for the right reasons. So. Yeah, it's basically around demystifying anything related to artificial intelligence because I, I really like this field and, and new technologies. And so right now, I also focus on my research career. So I try to improve the this, the skills of explaining some complicated concepts as simply as possible, like making things sound simpler. And that's what I've been doing for three years now. So <clears throat> I'm still learning and I'm, I'm trying to get better at this, but I really love doing this. And yeah, I really like to, in French, we say vulgariser, but in English it's like popularized, but it's not really the right word. But anyways, th there's no word for that, but I really like doing this uh, simplifying kind of content. And yeah, the whole channel is, is around that and also around around getting people into the field of artificial intelligence. Like I started doing, in fact, I, I started the channel for me because I, I was learning artificial intelligence myself. And so I decided to explain the terms and concepts that I was learning to make sure that I understood them correctly and also to allow anyone to, to quickly get the same understanding I had from a specific term, for example, uh, I have a series of really bad, small, uh, short videos around 
each covering one concept like uh, deep learning and uh, natural language processing, just like one specific word or concept in the field. And I try to explain them in one or two minutes just to basically have the terminology in the field before entering. And yeah, so I have all kinds of videos and a lot of different videos to come. For example, my new series that I really am excited about is to demystify the different roles in the field. So basically I will just do interviews with data scientists, uh, machine learning engineers, machine learning architects, machine learning research scientists, etc. like all the different titles, just so, so that people that actually want to do AI and get, get started in the field, know where to go or like, what's it like to be a professional in each of these subfields. So, so basically if I summarize, you kind of want to help people to get into the field and you also want to explain complex concepts in kind of simple terms. So either your new series on job titles, which could be confusing or research algorithms, which might be more complex. You want to take all of those, make them more simple to basically reach a wider audience in some sense. Yeah, exactly. It's mainly to allow everyone, including my parents or like people that are not at all in the field, just to at least understand how, I don't know, the Netflix algorithm works just so that like they know that they are not being controlled and their brain are being scanned or something like uh, just demystify a bit how it works and that it's not really intelligent or like just I, I feel like it's better it's really important to at least at a high level understand what it does so that you are not scared that it will just like we are one step away from AGI or something like it's just to yeah basically just just I feel like for any concept in life, even for nutrition or, or sports, it's important to at least know what a calorie is and like just to know these basic concepts at a high level. It's, it's important for anything in life, including technologies and artificial intelligence. And I don't know why, but it's not thought anywhere. And like, for example, my, my mother or just anyone, most people I know don't know anything about AI until chat GPT. And that's like the only thing they know. So, and, and they think like it's, it will revolutionize the world and that it's like extremely powerful, whereas it, it, it is, but it's not as powerful as they may think. So yeah, I'm, I, I feel like it's important to, to have a high level understanding of, of these concepts. So that's, that's what I try to do. Do, do you fear? AI algorithms then, because you, you mentioned something at the beginning, like, or give a reason to fear them or not fear them. Do, do you personally fear AI algorithms? Well, not personally, because I'm working with them. So in the worst case, like, it's kind of bad to say, but I will profit from the, the wins of artificial intelligence because I develop, I, well, I develop them in, in research and in the healthcare. So it's not like. I won't really profit from, from it really, but like, for example, there are some fears to have, like some jobs will definitely disappear and, but it will create new jobs, just, just like any technology shift. And yeah, so like it's, it's, there are some founded fears, like it's fine to be afraid of losing your job if, if it seems to be easily automated and and done by something that can learn a, to reproduce a pattern, I guess. But in my case, like it's, it's not, it's not scary for me personally, but for a society, maybe I'm, but I, I'm pretty optimistic in, in life in general. So I, I don't think I'm not really afraid. Like, I don't think it will be worse than today. I assume as always, the problem will, will come with humans themselves. So I don't think like, yeah, maybe such technologies will help them probably, but in, in the end, it's, it's all about humans and hopefully we will make the right choices and everything will, will go well. 
So, so you see this more as the AI will kind of automate the repetitive and boring tasks rather than like doing more complex things, leave like the main business decisions or the complex things to, to humans. Well, for now, obviously, but in the future, no one knows. I, I don't know. I also think just humans in general, just like, like yourself, like it's satisfying to have ideas and, and concretize them. So I don't think we want something else to decide for us and, and we just follow the order. And I assume that's why you also are doing some podcasts and other stuff is because you like to create things. We like to create things and control things. And so it's not it. Well, for me, it's not interesting to have something that tells me what to do. And that's why I, I do my things on YouTube and towards the eye is because I currently don't really want to have someone that tells me what to do. So that's, I don't know, like it, it will obviously become better and better and be more used for creative stuff, just like Dolly and ChatGPT. But I definitely think that the repetitive and easy task will be, well, easy, the repetitive and easy for machines tasks will be automated more quickly and maybe lead to some kind of like universal revenue or something just like the ideal world of machines doing everything and we we don't have to do manual labor mm -hmm. but i like i see this as a as an easier possibility than having machines that are really intelligent like it's definitely easier to do to automate a whole uh, factory rather uh, compared to having replicate a human being or something. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so you don't think machines are intelligent yet? Chat GPT isn't intelligent yet? No, I... Well, it, it, it definitely depends on how you define intelligence. And, well, how do you define intelligence? Well, that's a good question. I would say... You should be reacting to to something. So it's being able to constantly improve and react to things. That that's how I see intelligence. Um, so if, when, like, yeah, so when a robot beat the master chess player, this means it's intelligent, or it is still not. Yeah, I was seeing this more in terms of human life. Like, you know, if it's getting cold, you should react and put a mm. jacket. And if things evolve, you should learn from it and get better all the time. So in this sense, an AI algorithm is intelligent. Yes, but only in the context of chess, right? It will only, it can only improve. In chess, if you ask this algorithm to wear a jacket, or if you ask this algorithm to play another game, um, to play tennis, for example, they can't do it. So they are intelligent in some sense, but they aren't generally intelligent because they can only adapt to a single task, if you see what I mean, rather yeah. than we human can adapt to lots of different tasks. We can see, we can read, we can talk, we can play tennis, we can play chess. Um, so that's what intelligence might be fine for a simple, a single task, but general intelligence is being able to adapt, react, progress at multiple tasks. How yeah, do you I, see this? Yeah, I agree with you. And I think, for example, ChatGPT is, is, yeah, we can say it's intelligence, but it, it's intelligent, but very specifically. In fact, I don't even know if I can say that it's intelligence, it's basically probabilities and just lots of examples. So I don't know if like it, it, as you said, intelligence, even for a specific task is being able to react and improve, but like chat GPT is fixed right now. It, it cannot react and improve. So is it intelligent? I, yeah, I don't 
think so. It's it's just really well built and well engineered. Like that's the most important thing. I, I think it's 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 just really well done and well engineered. Like the engineering part is the 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 highlight here. But I don't think it's intelligent. It's just a powerful tool that we can use, but not something that is itself intelligent. I think there's a way to say that any AI is intelligent and there's a way to say that any AI is not intelligent. It just dep depends on how you frame it. So yeah, I, I really don't know. I, I, I will, I must say that I, I feel like it's not really intelligence, especially the more, I feel like the more that you get into the field, the, the less you think it is intelligent, mm -hmm. I think. I'm not sure if this is a general uh, conception of of the field, but the the more I learn about, for example, I was fascinated by by convolutional neural networks and everything like that, and then I I just learned how the filters and that that products and everything works, and it's just it, it's basically just math. So it's it's like there's no intelligence really. And now I am think that that I'm thinking about it. Can, could we really understand how something works if it is intelligent? I feel like that's what's complex to understand. Like we don't understand why and how we are intelligent this way. And I feel like if we don't even understand how how we are intelligent, we couldn't understand how something else is intelligent. Mm -hmm. So maybe, yeah, I don't know. It's a really Deep yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, no, I see what you mean that like chat GPT it looks like even from the eyes of a data scientist, it's not like I fully understand how it works, but it looks like a huge pattern recognition algorithm. You just give it like millions and billions of texts from the internet and then it figures out the interesting patterns, but it's still pattern recognition, like other kinds of yeah. simpler algorithms. So it doesn't look generally intelligent, at least not to me, but yeah, let's see how it goes. I can see that it's, I mean, the results are so surprising that if you yeah. don't know AI, you might think this thing is intelligent and that's just the first version. A new one is going to come in a few years or yeah. maybe two, three new versions are going to come and it's going to be, even if, by looking at the maths, it doesn't look intelligent. If you just talk to it and it answers as you want, it, you start to think that it is kind of intelligent. But yeah, I agree. It's it's a difficult notion and it's difficult to understand at which point we're going to cross intelligence. At, uh, intelligence. Like at which point are we going to say, okay, no, this algorithm is actually intelligent. I think it's going to be much more gradual than just saying, okay, no, we've reached general intelligence or intelligence. Yeah. yeah, well, I think it's a an history fact that we always say that when, for example, when a, a machine will beat a human at chess, it will be intelligent. And then when it happens, we say that no, it, it has to pass the Turing test or whatever. And then no, it has to do something else more complicated. We will just always push the boundaries until it can beat us at absolutely everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's we can always do do better, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's shift to I mean, I want to go back to what's AI. We mentioned that your YouTube channel is explaining algorithms in simple terms. So, this means that if you want to explain those algorithms, you first need to read those research papers, you need to understand them. What's your way of doing this? Like research papers or yeah, reading research papers in general is something very intimidating to a lot of people who want to get into the field. You've probably been intimidated by research papers as well. So yeah, yeah tell me a bit more. How did you start and what's your approach to read and understand a research paper? Yeah, I stumbled upon my first research paper. And to me, this was extremely intimidating, especially because I'm by, night, by, by nature quite bad with uh, English speaking. 
and so it it was definitely um yeah, i forgot the word but complicated to to tackle and also it it looked like something that that would be in the movie like well it it it's all, it was also the paper i i chose but it was like super old and really int uh, really intimidating like an old complicated mathematics paper like something that is not accessible at all and so i yeah i definitely didn't understand it <laughs> and i just then i just looked for other papers and sorry and got into the field i really wanted to to get better at at research in general and so I, I I knew that I needed to understand how to read research papers and my I don't know how it led to that but my vision was that by doing by explaining them simply in YouTube videos which I I wasn't a YouTuber or anything mm -hmm. it it made I don't know why but it made sense because it basically allowed me to practice everything that I wanted to practice, like speaking in English, um, reading research papers, explaining something as simply as possible. And so by explaining them, making sure, making sure that I understood them. And it also forced me to, by doing a video every week, it forced me to uh, at least read one paper per week, mm -hmm. which I ended up do reading way more, but still it's, at the beginning, it, it forced me to read more papers, which was really helpful. But yes, it was really intimidating. I, at least right now with uh, conferences, the papers are, are like 10, pa 10 pages lo long, like at max. So it's not that intimidating anymore. And also the math are, sometimes they are completely omitted. Like there, there's no math at all. And other times it's just, like you see the the formula and you you already recognize it like mm -hmm. it's a it's a convolution or or whatever and so it's the the more you get used to it the simpler it is and yeah at the beginning i was reading the whole paper like i assume most people do when they start and then for example if you are trying to find a better network for classifying eye diseases you you will find let's say you find 10 papers you don't have to read the introduction and the related works for all 10 of those because it's it will basically be the same thing so you can jump straight to the well you can see the abstract and the, the images and and see if it looks interesting in the results but then you can jump to the method and experimentation which is most interesting and well mo most interesting if you want to replicate and understand and so it's it becomes you become more, more and more efficient the more you read papers but the first one is definitely uh, a good learning step and it's yeah i think there's no other way around it's it's intimidating but you just have to start reading and you you google everything and now what's even cooler is that you can basically just copy paste a paragraph that you don't understand and ask chat GPT to mm -hmm. make it simpler. <laughs> so that's, that's already a good, a good tool. And also I don't remember the extension, but there are browser extensions that link lots of papers to videos, either from the authors or from people like me, uh, Yannick Kilcher or Leticia or other people that do a, like explanation videos. And so it's, I think it's a good way to start reading the paper just have a, a, a general overview like i do and like, like okay you know you understand that what, what it does and a bit how and then you can dive in the paper which make make makes it a lot more digestible I, i'd say that just get get started and read one from beginning to the end but attentively with a, a highlighter and as i said a good a good trick is to if you don't understand something don't uh, skip it and continue google the word or use chat gpt or something and try to understand the section that is a blocker because i from my experience this blocker will be essential for your compression to the next things so you you will just get deeper and deeper into a bad word into uh mm -hmm. 
yeah into shit <laughs> but yeah yeah i see so basically the first paper is going to be quite challenging obviously but as if you don't give up on this first paper try to really understand it from the abstract till the conclusion well you kind of build some knowledge and then you you will it will be easier to understand the second paper the third paper and once yeah. you've understood 10 or 20 papers uh, you've got this kind of prior knowledge that will help you understand other papers as well so the more papers you read the easier it become which kind of makes sense i guess yeah and yeah and if you start yeah like you don't have to start with papers you can directly go to the author's project page or or just try to google for example at towards the eye there are a lot of people writing and making things similar to what i do where they try to explain research or explain codes or like there are a lot of resources online to to find easier not explanations but like people that framed the research in a more friendly user way mm -hmm. so like obviously the papers is as i said you so you oftentimes have a maximum of 10 pages and so you need to be extremely concise you need to have everything you want to say in these 10 pages as well as all the the proofs the math the the experiments and everything so it's you cannot really make it digestible you have to make it complex and it's also just the way research is like i ask, i don't know why but i feel like researchers that just it's if you publish at a conference you are kind of obligated to to make your paper sound complicated mm -hmm. like you 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 have to use bad grammar ways like for example when i i tried to improve my my english writing i read a lot of books for writers and it's funny because i at the same time i was learning how to write papers and and to do to to publish a, a research paper and i i saw like the difference i i don't remember the how how it's called but there are some things that like it's when you are writing a book or a novel or news or every or anything that you want to make it sound interesting you, you there are some rules you need to respect and some things you need to not do and in in a research papers like the things you you are mm -hmm. forbidden to do in in a in a news article or whatever it's mandatory in a research papers so it's like it's the complete opposite and it's of obviously it's it will not be interesting like it's it's not uh there there won't be any catch lines or or things to keep you to keep your attention like it's it's boring but it's just a really dense information it's an information dense piece and it's a completely different style and i i think that's also why it's it may be intimidating it's because the just the way the the sentences are are written is just extremely formal and boring and it since we are used to books and movies series like it's really less dynamic and less yeah it, it doesn't grasp your grasp your attention so it's hard to to stay focused and continue reading but the yeah the more you do it the easier it becomes and also it's not mandatory i assume like i i'm not really i've worked in the in the industry a bit but it's what it was a research role so i i read research mm -hmm. papers but i think i assume most roles well I, I i will know that because of my new series thanks to that but i assume right now i i'm assuming that most roles do not require you to read research papers like engineering roles or other i assume like it's more that if you really want to re to read research papers you can but otherwise you you can just look at their code and implement it or yeah, i don't know if it's, would, maybe you have yeah i would agree most like I, I mean on my side i'm a data scientist in a startup i mean we are 400 so it's not really a startup more a scale up and you don't really need 
on a monthly or weekly basis to read research papers. You can do this if you want to um, on your spare time. Sometimes I had like one or two projects where you need to read one research paper just because the yeah. method you want to implement is going to be close to what this research paper is doing. So yeah. sometimes you would need it, but it's really like maybe I think I've done it twice or three times and I've been working for like two years. So it's really <laughs> not frequent. Um, so yeah, obviously it's not mandatory, but I know a lot of people want to start reading research papers and yeah. they find this intimidating. So I guess getting started and consistency, trying to really understand every part or most of the, the paper is really what's needed. Yeah. Or just... Like if you don't want to just to implement the papers, but want to improve at reading them, you can also, it, it's completely fine if you don't get some parts. Like I, I assume you can understand relatively easily the abstract introduction related works. And you don't have to understand the method. Oftentimes it's just a lot of math and like it's, it's not really necessary. You can... You can try to understand them. It's it's good to just get your brain used to these formulas and just try to like give it a look and give it a go at just trying to to follow what it does, but read quickly. It's not that it's not mm -hmm. a big deal if you don't get it. And then experiments, I assume you can skip if you just want to read the paper because it's not that interesting. And then the discussion is is also interesting, but keep in mind that it's the the discussion is basically the analysis and conclusion of the authors and you may end up with a different conclusion with the same experimental results so like don't assume that everything they say is right and it's the only conclusion but it's it's still interesting to to see what they conclude from this from these research and experiments and yeah as i said for the I assume that it also helps to have a better mathematical foundation. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's good to learn some math and there are there are some great uh, resources online even free so it's like you can you can definitely learn that if you want to to really understand the papers. But otherwise I think you can just not stick to but you can start with articles and videos on YouTube. For example, just Yannick Kilcher, I think, does a really good job in doing one step further than what I do. Like, I do some kind of overview and I dive a bit into the architecture and, and try to give, yeah, a, a good overview of, of how it works. Like, and I dive a little bit into the architecture and and why it works. But if you, my, my videos are like five to eight minutes. And so I, I try to have something that is relatively information dense and at a high level. Whereas Yannick's previous videos, it's been a while now, but when he was doing paper videos, it was like 30 minutes to one plus hour. And he just really goes through the whole paper and oftentimes explains even the mathematics and everything. It, it actually helped me when I was starting. And I think it's really a, a really good channel. And even better than that, I think, um, I don't remember the exact name of the channel, so sorry, but uh, it's Coffee Break with Leticia, I think, or AI Coffee Break, something like that. But it's it's Leticia, the YouTuber, and she's doing amazing explanations of like attention, uh, transformers. Recently, his her, mo her most recent video is about um gpt zero i think it's called like the the classifier for for finding if the uh, if a text is generated or real and yeah she did she does amazing explanations and kind of animations in the in the style of uh what is it called three brown one blue mm -hmm. so it's like it's it's really good i really like her channel and i really recommend it if you are starting or even in the field it's just really well done and interesting and it helps you like she, she does paper reviews but makes it much more simpler and then you can try to jump in the paper and 
you will already have some foundation that will help you understand it much easier, which will help you understand future papers. And yeah, so I think it's a YouTube channels are, are really a great way to speed up the process if you are into videos. Otherwise, there, there are some articles as well. So it's definitely a good thing to get used to it, obviously, but you can also get used to it by other media than the papers themselves. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I think it's good to be aware that, yeah, reading articles and watching videos is also a good thing to do and maybe start doing this before reading yeah. a research paper. I think that's that's kind of a good thing to do. I've also done this before reading my first research paper. Um, I want to talk a bit about your videos. I mean, I'm very, I've watched a few videos. I've watched the uh, chat GPT one, which was quite interesting to get a high level understanding of how it works. I know that at the end of, I don't know if it's at the end of every year, but I think pretty much at the end of every year, you're doing a review of some of the best algorithms. I think it's focused on computer vision, which is where you're mostly interested in. So let's talk about this. What are your top one or two algorithms of the past year? What, what, do, you, what do you think were the most impressive algorithms? Let's maybe not talk about ChatGPT since we've talked about it already. Yeah. Um, okay, that that is a hard question because, as my girlfriend would say, my memory is extremely bad, and I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> and so I actually, as you said, I do a, a yearly review of what happened in the field, and it's it's basically I I take all the videos that I do, I select my like top ten, fifteen, and then I do a condensed video that showcases the results and and have short like one-liners explanation for each of them and yeah i think this is really cool just to to look back on what happened during the year and it also helps me uh, uh, i don't have the word um, like it helps me replay what happened and and just refresh mm -hmm. my memory but i did that now a month and a, and some weeks ago and <laughs> it's already it already left my my memory i i just remember that i i think um latent wait how how the, how is it called the architecture behind stable diffusion latent diffusion i think um, well anyways this i think this paper was in early 2022 but maybe it was late 2021 i'm not completely sure but that that was definitely a big step up, I think, just because it, as we've seen with stable diffusion, it does great results and allows people to use it in like lot less compute than, for example, diffusion models. That basically latent diffusion means that you are doing the same process, diffusion process of of um, using random noise to generate an image. So you basically tr train a model to add noise and learn which noise to add mm -hmm. to a, a precedent noise in order to reconstruct an image. And so you do that by taking an image, adding random noise, and then you do the reverse step with the with a model that is being trying to do that. But this uh, forces you to, to stay in the image space, we say. So like... Uh, 256 by 256 image, lots of pixels, and so lots of, of compute and and memory needed. Whereas this is the diffusion, the, the basic basic diffusion approach. But the authors that I don't have the name right now came up with latent diffusion, which means using an encoder and, and, and a decoder around this diffusion process. So you basically take the image and use a trained encoder to compress the information and keep only like the most re relevant information. So instead of having pixels, you will have some kind of, of numbers that is understandable by the machine, but not by you. And then you use the, diffuse, the same diffusion process on these numbers and then reconstruct the final numbers into a real image. And so it allows you to work in a much more, in a much smaller space and 
have basically allow allow you to have a, an image generator run on your own GPU instead of of on I don't know what it, it's required by Dali, but mm -hmm. on something much bigger. <laughs> no, but, but that's fine. I mean, just just wanted to get your idea on a cool paper that you're thinking about. Yeah, well, this one and and ChatGPT is definitely mm -hmm. the coolest, I think. And even though ChatGPT is not a paper, but again, um, I did a video about ChatGPT, but Leticia did a video about I don't remember the ChatGPT and a paper that DeepMind published around, around a, a, an approach that is very similar to ChatGPT. And so she 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 had like a deeper um, explanation of both of these similar approaches. And it, yeah, it's a really good video. And yeah, I don't... Sparrow, I think. I think her video is like ChatGPT and Sparrow, something like that. It's a really good video to better understand ChatGPT and how it was built. Okay, so let's move on to the other section that I want to talk about, which is more your career. We've talked a lot on your YouTube channel, your explaining research papers or research algorithms in simple terms. You've done things on ChatGPT and many other algorithms. I think your latest video was actually something on text to music, something like that. I've actually watched this video. Very yeah. cool. Uh, an algorithm which basically take some text as input and translate this into music. I found this application quite cool. So definitely go and subscribe to What's AI. It's a great YouTube channel. Now I want to focus on your career a bit more. Uh, we haven't talked too much about how you got into the field and your current PhD. So let's start first by how did you get into the field? I know you started stu by studying engineering. So how did you actually get into the field of AI and machine learning? Yeah, I indeed I started in engineering. More precisely, it was uh, systems engineering, and it was at at ETS. It's like a a university in Montreal that is more into the industry compared to other universities. So like they, they basically say that they are creating engineers for the industry. And this means that we have lots of internships. For example, in my, I think it's, it's a four year degree and I had four, four months internship. So every summer I went, mm. uh, well, I had to find the internships, but I, I went into companies working for them and as, a, as an engineer systems engineer and I really didn't like it <laughs> so <laughs> I was always looking for something that I will like doing and yeah I was getting a bit uh, desperate towards the end just because I, I it was gonna end and I didn't want to do basically what I was doing was to to go into uh, factories and try to either automatize something or make something more productive productive or yeah use uh, robots to replace humans basically and this wasn't something that interested me i didn't want to do that at all so i don't know why i was in this <laughs> engineering field but it's it's the one that yeah i know what why why i was in this field is because there was basically i didn't know what to do and i followed my friends into university and at this specific university, it was only engineering. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew that I wanted to, as we say in French, like um, do the, follow the path that opens the, the most doors. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I just wanted to, to, to stay open to all possibilities. So I knew that engineering was a good choice just because it's, you can do a lot of good jobs, even though I, I, I would have maybe preferred to go towards philosophy or something else but if like it, there are no jobs for philosophy so i mm -hmm. this wasn't really a, a viable option even though it was a fun one but yeah so i i went to engineering and i i didn't know which one to take we basically have a the first year is like a common year with mm -hmm. courses from mechanical engineering electrical uh, um, software engineering 
and like robots i don't remember the name but yeah i really liked playing with robots at this time and i also a bit liked i i've always liked to be a, a bit more general so I, I liked a bit everything and what they told me was that systems engineering was basically a bit of everything and so i i, I went to do that and yeah as i said i i didn't really enjoy it and well i enjoyed the courses but i didn't I enjoyed most courses, but I, I didn't really enjoy the, the internships. And then, as I said, during my last year, I had my first class of artificial intelligence, which yeah was in my degree and was I, I really loved it. And I'm a really shy person. And so we had a presentation at the, the end of the class. Just, we had a competition and then a presentation around this competition where we basically explain what we did and the results we had mm -hmm. and it was like the first time that I was obviously super stressed but it, it, it was the first time in my life that I actually liked doing the presentation in front of, of actual people it's it wasn't even on zoom <laughs> so it's like it was extremely difficult for me at the time and I, I was not comfortable at all but in this one I was and I really liked it i even liked at, at the end we always well for the shy people we always hope that there will not be any questions just because we want it to end but this time there were there were a lot of questions and i i really liked just chatting about this and yeah even if i was wrong or i didn't know the answer it was just fun to to exchange and just understand so i yeah that's maybe the foundation behind the YouTube channel that came much later, but that was definitely a fun experience. And I, I've also, uh, I've, I've known since, since I was young that I liked the idea that I had of being a researcher, which I had no idea what it was, but I knew like uh, Einstein and the, the big names. And I, I, I found it cool to being in a lab and like trying to just think of of creating things or making things better. And so I directly felt like AI was the, the perfect field just because I, I liked to explain it. I liked mm -hmm. to, to work on it. And it was also a way to use math and, and, and research and apply it. It's, it's, it's just like the perfect combination for me on everything. So it was, a lot of fun and then I had a second course and then a project uh, at the end of my degree we call it a final years project something like that it's a French word mm -hmm. yeah we, acronym, so yeah, I, yeah I it's, but it's the same. Uh, yeah we same in England yeah, so we uh, final year <laughs> project oh, okay it's it's, a, it's, a, it's actually called that way yeah you can have or... a final year project or you can have a Okay. research thesis but yeah i think final year project is fine okay well yeah so we, we had this that was the whole summer instead of an internship and i really liked it and it was basically the the project i talked about the research on eye conditions mm -hmm. and so it was really fun and then i asked the same professor to do a master's with him at ets still and um and then yeah i this is where I started. Okay, I don't remember exactly the timeline, but I started my YouTube channel around that or maybe during. Whoa. Okay, I don't remember the exact timeline, but I, I started YouTube around my last year slash uh, master's degree. And then, yeah, I just basically learned through my last year of engineering school, so quite late, like in 2019, mm -hmm. 18, 19, something like that. And it school definitely wasn't enough. And I was learning online at the same time. And I feel like, well, it, it's a definitely a personal case, but school wasn't necessary at all. Like I, I could have learned everything online and it's basically what I did. Like I learned, I, I was really into getting better and, and understanding what everything of this was. 
And I also wanted to do good in my, in my AI class. So I just, I was like learning about the topics that was about to be discussed. That, yeah, that was about to be discussed. And so I already understood it a bit and just confirmed it during the class. And it was just a great way to, to learn, I think. Just have at the same time two different ways of of explaining the same concepts. I don't know it. Well, I was just really motivated and it, it was it, it was a great time. And then I did my I just had two classes basically of artificial intelligence. And then I had my masters with which was around research mostly, mm -hmm. not not classes and so i learned by myself by myself online and through reading research papers or articles or doing some courses especially by stanford and and uh, as everybody knows andrew and g and others and so yeah online is definitely a good way and that's pretty much how i started even though the university helped and my professor helped a lot as well like he gave me Lots of private one-on-one -on -one mini courses on very specific topics that I don't think I could have find anything else. So a anywhere else. So it, yeah, it was definitely worth uh, worthwhile for me to do a master's degree mm. to 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 learn more. So, but yeah, as I said, there's a lot of different ways to get into the field and and improve. It's it's interesting that you've done. An online. Well, you basically did a, did some courses, but you did the same thing online and tried to basically get ahead of the class in some sense. Yeah, yeah. It was maybe. I don't know if it. No, I I'm not really a competitive person, so I assume it was not because of that. But I wanted to do well in the competition, but just it wasn't to beat others. It was just because I really liked. Mm -hmm. I I wanted to just to solve the problem basically <laughs> and do my best and I don't know it, it's just what I wanted to do when I came back home like I wasn't into gaming anymore I just wanted to to learn more and yeah it's, it was just fun to to understand these things and it I don't know especially the I don't remember the exact course but it was from Justin Justin something it's the Stanford class and it was really interesting and uh, yeah it's especially on YouTube like it's fun you just basically it's just like this podcast you relax and you learn mm -hmm. so it's just lots of fun and you even though it's definitely not for example how I was doing it was definitely not, definitely not the best way to learn like I was eating at the same time or I was just like really relaxed on my chair and everything and so I didn't take much notes because I knew that I had my actual class that I was taking notes but I, I still think it's a really good way of understanding to have different um, modalities mm -hmm. I don't have the the easier term right now but different uh, point of view. yeah different ways of learning like e either yeah visual or listening or writing and i feel like the and also uh, to me because the class were all in french since ets is a french school in montreal it was i felt like it was necessary to learn it in english just because the terms are different everything is different and my english was still bad it, it is still bad but it was extremely bad at the time and so i yeah i felt like i just felt like it was the only option I don't know why, but yeah, yeah, no, I think that's good. It's yeah, I think your English isn't that bad. Actually, you keep saying it's bad. No, it, it's actually quite <laughs> good. And yeah, it's great to see that you. Well, you've done a master, and you still recommend online courses. You still think online courses can be quite valuable. You you mentioned yeah. during your master that it was mostly research. So, what did you work on during your master? What was this research about? What kind of algorithms did you use? Can you dive a bit into this? Yeah, basically it was around conventional neural networks and be mostly because my professor really liked them. And I think he still 
likes them more than transformers and other architectures and i do agree it's because they are very simple they are like elegant and really optimal and so my master's degree was to we it's it was basically two steps first it it was to try to visualize and understand how information is being propagated into these networks so basically when you send an image it does convolutions repetitively and we wanted to visualize these these uh, the, the resulting steps after each convolution to see what was happening and and why the networks that were doing that and everything and so i was using pre-trained networks very simple stuff um like using keras or uh, at the end pytorch and just implementing the pre-trained uh, rest nets dense nets all vggs all, all convolutional non-convolutional models that were trained on ImageNet and then testing them with random images either that were part of ImageNet or not just to see how it reacted and where the information were were going was going and everything and uh, then we did some experiments trying to always to visualize what was happening and at the end well after like I don't know, after a bit more than a year, we found some interesting patterns towards the bottleneck layer. So like the, the last layer, after the last convolution, there's some kind of the, the most compact layer, which is usually something in the range of like a dimension of seven by seven. So a very small image of seven by seven, but with, but with lots of channels, like mm -hmm. 2000 channels, instead of, for example, three, a, a regular image could be a, high definition, like 1920 per 1080p. So this, this, these are the pixels, uh, horizontal and vertical. And then you will have red, red, green, and blue, the three channels. So it's basically just filters, filtering three colors. But instead, the, con the convolutions learn their own filters instead of being the colors. So you have 2000 learned filters which is basically, you can see it as an image. It's, it's basically the same thing as an image. It's just instead of having RGB filters, you have learned filters. So it's, it's basically a small image with a lot of different channels. And yeah, so we, we were using this bottleneck layer into some experiments, either uh, we call it disentangling, but like building a memory with those, those, uh, extracted layers and then trying to do classification tasks using this memory but in different ways for example either comparing the full the full tensor or comparing like a max pooling version of it an average pooling version of it or as we said a disentangled version of it which was basically instead of comparing each tensor with each tensor and finding the nearest tensor we would take each individual pixel with pixel with two two thousand channels, and compare them with all other pixels in the memory, and then finding the most similar pixels. And at the end for classification, we will basically look for what was the class that was most recurring into all of the pixels that we sent. I don't know if it's that clear. I don't think so. But, but what did but, you try? Like, what was the visualization? Like, what was the goal, yeah. the high level goal of the, of this? Yeah, sorry. This was the, basically the last experiment, but it was to, basically the goal was to understand what was important in the bottleneck layer. Like are the channels more relevant or are the spatial information in the mm -hmm. image relevant or like, where is the information is in this tensor. And so we did lots of experiment to to try to improve the accuracy in different okay. tasks by focusing on specific parts of the tensors, basically. And then the second part of my master's was to basically rebuild a CNN to try to optimize what we saw. And it was very simple in my end. It was just to add some, some uh, fully connected layers and basically modify the loss a little bit and just add a term like it's just, it's similar to a regularization term. So it's, it wasn't a big, uh, it was a master's degree, <laughs> but it wasn't like 
extremely complicated, but it worked relatively well. And we are trying to publish it now, but yeah, it's like it's basically what it does is yeah, regularize the training and which makes the architecture, for example, just a, a ResNet, it makes it a bit better for any task. So it's it, it allows the, the a CNN architecture, any any CNN architecture to be more general or mm -hmm. to better leverage the information it receives. So that's that's about it. And yeah, that, that was my okay. master's degree, mostly computer vision and CNNs. And you stick to computer vision with your PhD. You've just, well, you've recently started your PhD with Mila, right? And you're, yeah. you're all sticking to computer vision. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm switching modalities. I, instead of using images, I'm using MRIs, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I'm, I'm sticking to computer vision, but it's, it wasn't really my choice. Well, ultimately it was, but the process with Mila is that you apply at Mila and then professors reach out with their projects and lab and you chat with them and you figure out if you want to go there or not. And so I was lucky enough for this professor to reach out. And then I talked to, to his students and previous students and current students and it 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 felt like a perfect match and from what i understood speaking with a lot of people that did a phd or were doing a phd the most important thing was to find a good professor mm -hmm. that could give you some time and teach you rather than a, a project you were passionate in because the project can change or or just if you have problems in the project and you don't like your professor then everything goes wrong or something like it's definitely more important to have someone that is nice to you and that you like working with and learning from and that can give you some time like it's it's you don't have to you must not aim for like the bigger name the person that is most known i assume it, it, it obviously it depends but this person might not have a lot of time to to give you or to teach you so it may not be optimal but yeah it, it definitely depends but yeah so i I felt like it was the perfect match and I didn't know much about medical data or anything, but I felt like it was a, a very interesting problem just because it was actually useful. My PhD is about um, segmentation of, of brain and spinal cord MRIs to find uh, multiple sclerosis lesions and help um, neurologists to yeah find them earlier or just help them, for example, we would scan a scan. Mm -hmm. we, we will use our, our algorithm on a scan and try to find the different uh, lesions. And then the neurologist will look at our segmented scan and see, and it, it will just help the process be faster and allow him to him or her to, to go through more scans and just be more efficient. It's not to replace them, it's, mm -hmm. it's really to help them. And so I think healthcare is, is a really interesting field, really challenging field and really important field. So it's it's really fun. And the more I get into it, the, the more interesting it becomes. So I'm not regretting it. And yeah, MRI data is really fun. It's, I, I didn't know anything about that before and now I'm 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 currently taking a course on MRI data specifically and it's really interesting and yeah, really complex and really fun. Yeah, it's nice to see it looks like it's I mean I'm not a specialist in medical imaging, but it looks like it's getting more common to have you don't want the algorithm to replace the doctor or no. the human because it's something very sensitive and also I don't think we're ready as a society for example I wouldn't accept that an AI makes a decision uh, about what I have or what I should do in terms of yeah. like medical diagnosis but I think it's great to have the AI help the doctor or the 
neurosurgeon, as as you mentioned, um, make make decisions faster and better. So it looks like this is yeah. the case in in your setting, right? Yeah, and it's also especially to help them. Like lesions are hard to to see on an MRI, even with experienced. Uh, neurologists, there are, there are a lot of interviability between neurologists. If, like for the same scan, different experts will annotate the scan differently. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really complicated. And if we build a strong algorithm, it will actually like help them just, they, w they wouldn't have seen this one maybe, which could be a really important lesion or like, for example, they could look at a scan and not see anything, but our algorithm would, would see something small. Mm -hmm. And then they will look more into it and, and, and think like, oh, this could actually be a, a first lesion. And so they will start the treatment as soon as possible. And I am not that familiar with multiple sclerosis, but unfortu unfortunately, it's not curable yet, I believe. And so they will start a treatment just to improve the the patient's life mm -hmm. but the sooner they start the better it will be the and the longer so it's definitely better to start sooner even though you cannot cure it but yeah it's 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 to help professionals and i think as you mentioned healthcare is definitely like the the last field to where we want to replace human mm -hmm. beings just because first nobody wants to be well i, I won't say nobody I think most people don't want to to be treated by a, a machine or an algorithm, especially one that cannot explain why it does what it does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so this is the first thing. And the second, the second reason is just an opinion. I don't want to discriminate anybody, but I feel like we need, uh, what's it called in English? Is it like a black sheep or something? Like we need, if, if something goes wrong during a, an, how do you call that? Uh, an operation. We need to blame someone. Need, yeah, you need to blame someone. Like that's the unfortunate way it works. <laughs> and so if it's a machine, you need basically to blame the hospital and like what, shut down the whole hospital? Like it's... I think that unfortunately we need human beings to take the blame for now and like yeah I, yeah this is a difficult problem but I think we need someone to be responsible for what's going to happen and that's like an, an incredible stress that doctors have to go through but yeah, if, if it's a machine that does that, now it's just like the autonomous, autonomous driving and everything. Like, who's mm -hmm. responsible? It's a whole other problem. Even though it works super well, what if one thing happened? Even if, like, if it's, like, 100 times better than doctors, there will be one failure case. And what happens with this failure case is super complex. And so, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of of different reasons why it won't replace humans anytime soon in the hospitals and healthcare industry. But at least it's a really good tool, just like ChatGPT is a good tool that you need to to control and and use optimally. But yeah, it's a mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good tool. The, I, I I will just leave it as that. It's a it's a tool. <laughs> Not something to replace something else no, yeah yeah that's it looks like this is how you see most of ai still as a tool to help humans rather than something intelligent or something that will completely replace everyone i mean it will it can still replace you mentioned that it can still replace people's job but mostly automated jobs um so in your case it it will still be a tool that will help doctors make better decisions, basically. Yeah, I think so, but I could be completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Like we have no idea what, what will happen. And especially I was in an interview a few weeks ago and 
so someone the, the interviewer made made me realize that but actually my 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 job in uh, on youtube is to explain something simply and like i asked for for this interview the the, uh, the person really wanted to talk about chat gpt and so before the interview i just tried it and i say like could you explain deep fakes like i'm five five years old and it did like a really good job And so even my own job of of things that we would assume would be a human skill mm -hmm. to try to to understand something enough to make it much more simple is actually already being like already possible to do with machines even though it's definitely sometimes hallucinating and and doing random stuff and it's not perfect but It it could already help me with my job, even though I like to do it. So I I'm not using ChatGPT for my videos or anything, but I could do it. So that's already something that yeah, it's it's definitely a powerful tool. Like I'm not I don't want to um, to uh, I don't have the word in English to make it sound that AI is not powerful. Like it's definitely extremely powerful and even more powerful than we may think but yeah I, i don't think it's going towards intelligence right now as um jan lecun recently shared like he's he believes that that chat gpt is just a divergent divergence from to, to towards agi like it's not going the right direction it's just basically scaling and having more examples and bigger models which is not how we build intelligence I, I'm just uh, m maybe I'm completely wrong and I'm not understanding well what what he said, so I don't want to put words in, in his mouth. But I I believe it is what he thinks, and yeah, I also think I also think this way. Some other people think that scaling is all you need, so mm -hmm. really depends. But yeah, there are definitely pros and and cons of of all these different algorithms and. Definitely useful and interesting times to see what will happen and and how we can be best leverage them. Yeah, thanks thanks for sharing your your view on this. That was quite quite interesting. And so, just want to actually finish the episode by asking one career advice. I ask this to everyone that comes to the podcast. Just wanted to have your view on a single advice that you will have for people to progress. In their career, like if you just want had one advice, what would it be? I think my advice would be to just how do you say that? Do do something in the public. Like if you are a student, I'd say okay, no, not even for just for students, but for anyone, I'd say that the most important thing if you want to progress in your career is to get a little bit out of your comfort zone that's first and also try to do something that can be seen by others mm -hmm. and that wouldn't be part of your current job or or studies so and it doesn't even have to be in the ai field or any field it, it can be for example just start a, a running group and try to to scale it or like <laughs> do just something That could be online or in your university or in your job and create something new that's i think that's the most important thing just because if you are the one creating something it will motivate you a lot and you will work harder and learn more just because you want the thing you are creating to be good and successful so even if it fails completely you will you will have taken like a lot of nights and weekends to learn instead of procrastinating or, or watching TV, which is extremely beneficial, even if your things completely fail. So I, I'd say, yeah, just just create something that is different from your current job and studies that will help a lot, I'm sure. Well, thanks a lot, Louis. It was great to have you on this show and to learn from you. 
have a great day in Canada and yeah, hope to catch up very soon. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It was a lot of fun and I wish you a great afternoon where you are. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.